All right, let's talk RPM measurement. Now on my thrust stand, I'm reading the RPM with an optical sensor right off the bell of the motor housing. And I do that by painting marks on the side of the bell that will trip the sensor every time they pass by. So if this is the motor bell, I'll paint a single white stripe, and I know that every time that passes by the sensor, it will trigger and I'll get a pulse that I can record the length of time. Now this here requires no calibration at all. By looking at the time between two pulses, that will always give me the average RPM of one entire revolution of the motor. It's really simple physically and electrically. There's nothing really in there that can throw it off. The problem comes in when I want to look at speed at fairly low RPMs. For example, when the motor's at idle, I can be getting less than 100 pulses a second out of it. So if I'm looking at motor acceleration from idle throttle to 10% throttle, the update rate that I'm getting is fairly low. Now, thankfully, it's really easy using this method of measuring RPM to increase my sample rate effectively of what I'm looking at. All I need to do is put another white mark on the other side of the motor. Now I'm going to get two pulses for every revolution and I know that the time between the first pulse and the second pulse is going to be the average RPM for the first half of the motor turning and the time between the second is going to be the average RPM for the second half. And in my case I use four white bars and so I'm getting four measurements of RPM for every rotation of the motor. But this brings on the new complication that I need to be able to calibrate this distance. So if we go back to a very simple case and just say I'm going to use two markers, if I have one of these markers at slightly a different position, the distance between marker one and two is different than between two and one. Now this is a very big example here, but even very minute differences in, in the width of the line and, and so forth make a big difference in the recording when you're recording at a uh, microsecond scale. Now there's ways you can handle this physically if you, um, you know, paint the marks extra accurate to begin with or have them lasered on or, or something like that. You can get uh, markers that will read consistently and you don't need to calibrate them separately but I'm just working in my garage and I'm using paint pens and so that's not really an option. So in order to calibrate for this distance the first method in my benchmarking routine I program a section of time and if we look at the RPM ramp that I'm doing in the test I program in an idle phase and then I have a calibrate phase which holds at that same idle RPM, and then I do my test ramp to look at the data that I'm actually interested in. And what I do in the calibrate phase is look at every single marker that comes by and find the average, because in here I'm holding a consistent RPM. So I know that even though this is reading short, and this is reading long, I know that they both represent exactly the same RPM. So I'm getting a whole bunch of individual RPM measurements in here and categorizing them by which marker index it is that's going by the head. Get an average of the individual times that are associated with each marker. So then I've got my little array of values here. Because I know that these times are supposed to be the same, then I can read this short value and know that I need a multiplier of say, you know, 1.12 and that this one is long. And so this, I need a multiplier of 0.95. And then maybe third one needs a multiplier of 0.98 because it's pretty close. And then after the calibration phase, every time that I read a pulse, I know which index that I'm looking at and it pops back and forth and can multiply the value that it just read by this correction factor and give you the actual RPM for this particular distance. So by doing this, we automatically figure out the relative distances between all of the markers that I put on there, even if they're not very accurately placed evenly. And that works okay, but I really don't need to have this dedicated calibration phase in my testing routine necessarily. I can actually get these same compensation values by just looking at the individual 
pulses over the course of the entire test. Now in the raw data, what this might look like if the white is what our actual RPM is here on the raw, it's going to be really close. And then that value is going to be deviated and that one reads high. And I still know that just like in the calibration, the, um, this calibration routine, I still know that I can average these two points and get back to this true middle RPM value. So when I'm recording RPM data, I'm recording the amount of time that it takes between pulses, but I'm also recording the index of the pulse as well. And because we know that the average between all of the pulses from one all the way back around to one is a true average RPM for that motor rotation, the true also holds if we start from from two. So if we measure from two to one and then back to two, this is also an accurate average RPM over the entire rotation of the motor. So I can take all of my RPM measurements that are spread out because of this inaccuracy in the markings and I can do a four point because I'm using four markers or so in this case a two point moving average for every single RPM measurement. And that gives me an accurate RPM for one whole revolution at that time. Now, unfortunately, because that's averaged, we're losing that high frequency information that we're really interested in that's riding on top of that average. So that really quick acceleration on the first half of the rotation and then holding steady in there, that gets smoothed and averaged out. But by looking at this average value, and comparing it back again to the original values we recorded. So if we zoom in on this, let's say that these dots are our average RPM that's recorded. And we know that we have one marker that's closer together. And so that's going to read high and one marker that's further away. So that's going to read low, high, low, high, low. We've calculated this average. We have the difference between the local average and our measured, and we can look at this difference for every single RPM measurement that we've done. And we also know the index of every single one of these um, measurements as well. So we know that this is one and that's two, and this is also one and that's two, and that's one and that's two. And we can build back the same sort of calibration values that we calculated by holding at a steady RPM and looking what the values were, even though the RPM value is moving. So we can see that every single one of these ones is an up arrow of, you know, roughly that magnitude. And all of the twos are down arrows of roughly that magnitude. So we can average all of these together and that gives us the correction value to move this point towards the average that we know is the true RPM value, but without giving up the little differences that happen in between because we're averaging a huge number of samples, thousands and thousands of samples over this entire test. And the only time that we have big differences in these um, kind of reverse engineered calibration values is when we have a rapid acceleration. If we say that's kind of the, uh, the calibration error, the value that we see is going to be steady through everywhere that it's steady. And then where you, if you have a sharp acceleration, you may see the error spike up and then rapidly drop down again as it returns to all of the uh, measurements being the same, even over this slow ramp here, uh, the, the RPM is not changing very rapidly from pulse to pulse. So the amount of error is going to be very, very low there. And when we take all of these thousands of entries and average them together, this extra little blip gets lost as basically just noise. And we're left with a calibration value that is basically the steady state. So I no longer need to do any sort of calibration routine during the actual test run, as long as I'm recording the index values and the raw 
uh, the raw timing of each tack pulse, all of that I can figure in my post-processing once it's gone onto the computer. 